Thank you for joining us today for another deep dive into an important topic on the AHA Leadership Dialogue series. It's great to be with you. I'm Joanne Conroy, CEO and President of Dartmouth Health and currently the Chair of the American Hospital Association Board of Trustees. I look forward to our conversation today as we talk about one of the most pressing issues in healthcare today, the sustainability and evolution of our nursing workforce. When I speak with colleagues across the country, workforce continues to be one of their top priorities. And increasingly, health systems are looking for innovative partnerships to help make an impact on their own local nursing pipeline. At Dartmouth Health, we're working to build a stronger, more robust workforce for the future through partnerships. Um, One that we have with Colby Sawyer College And we have many other ones with regional nursing schools to provide exceptional clinical training and educational pathways for those that are pursuing a nursing career. In the last year, our team welcomed over 250 new grad nurses and established a nurse residency program at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center that provides a structured and supportive orientation to help early career ADN and BSN nurses transition to practice and begin their nursing careers with confidence. I've done a lot of interdisciplinary rounding on our clinical units and can really appreciate the importance that this makes in really launching these nursing careers. As a rural healthcare system, we also recognize that retention is our best recruitment strategy and have implemented benefits that are aimed at supporting nurses long-term, whether it be through continued education, loan repayment, housing subsidies, um, as well as faculty opportunities with the Geisel School of Medicine in addition to our shared governance structure. So I'm excited to share what we've been doing to address workforce shortages, especially in nursing. But I'm really eager to hear what other organizations are doing and and what our guest can share with us today about the current state of nursing in our country. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joy Parchment, who not only serves on the board of the American Organization of Nurse Leaders, but also has a very impressive resume in nursing leadership, both within health systems and within academic medicine. Most recently, Joy served as Director of Nursing Strategy Implementation at Orlando Health before shifting over to her current role as Assistant Professor of Nursing at the University of Central Florida. Joy, thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure, and thank you so much for the honor of having a conversation with you. So um, our listeners love to get to know a little bit about our speakers before we launch into the discussion questions. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know how you navigated your career to where you are right now? Well, A little bit about me would be the first, I have to say that I always wanted to be a nurse. From the time I was three, four years old, my parents told me that I was playing nurse and I had some amazing models. I had two aunts who since passed away and we were, I was able to see how they interacted. They'd come back with their stories of what they've been able to do with patients. And I said, hmm, that sounds like something that would be intriguing for me. And so ever since I was three or four years old, I was always putting bandages on my, my brothers. <laughs> they didn't appreciate that. But I was always putting bandages on them, you know, and trying to fix them up and trying to think about what would make a a better way to to live because I looked at it from a prevention standpoint. And Mm -hmm. so I went to school, got a bachelor's degree, subsequently a master's, and then also a PhD. And one of the reasons why I did that, no organization made me go back and get my degree. It was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to learn more. And so I felt that I needed to continue to grow. And so that was part of the reason that I did that. I spent some time in ambulatory because I love the prevention side. I also mm-hmm. spent some time in acute care. And then I, I felt that it would be important to work on the practice environment. 
And because of that, I was able to implement standards in an organization, a system actually, to enhance, uh, actually it was the magnet standards, and to be able to enhance the practice environment. And because of that, we have been, we were able to then retain some nurses and also impact the community. Because when you think about it, we as healthcare providers are here to impact our community, not just the individuals that are in our organization. And so it was more of a broad perspective for me. And so I traveled through those sectors, ambulatory, academia, and then also the acute care environment. And then I said, hmm, I wonder if there's a possibility that I could have a different type of an impact, looking at it from a, a profession standpoint. How can I impact the profession to make things better for mm -hmm. our nurses, of course, but then ultimately for our patients? And so I have the awesome privilege and honor to be able to serve on the ANL board and to work alongside Side some amazing, amazing colleagues. So when we think about how we make a lot of our career decisions, um, a lot of them uh, are reflected in the role models that um, we have in our lives, as your aunts were, but also the role models that are in our professional organizations. And I'm sure you're a really important role model for a lot of young nurses that are thinking about what their career could evolve to. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank um, you. So let's start with some general questions about nursing trends that you've been seeing both in academia and also in you know the health system in which you you know brought about significant change. You know are there changes in the applicant pool? Are there um, expectations of the applicants that are different than they were 10 or 15 years ago? What are your thoughts? Well, some of the trends, you mentioned some when we were starting, and that was about workforce. And what we're seeing now is that, yes, it is projected. You know, the U.S. Bureau of Labor said that they have projected that we're going to have, nurses are going to have ample opportunities to be able to, to work because of, of what is actually needed. We're also seeing that there's going to be more needs for advanced practice nurses, those that are nurse practitioners, those that are um, midwives and some of those other roles. And we also are seeing a growth in entrepreneurship, nurse entrepreneurs. We are definitely seeing the impact of well-being on clinicians and the impact of burnout on the cl clinicians. So there's lots of trends related to how do we really identify what is causing the issues related to burnout. So there's that piece. And then, of course, there is the retention aspect of that. And I mean, what I mean by that is we have identified and we see that across our population that the baby boomers who are were so prevalent in all of our organizations, they are saying, it's time for me to retire. And so because of that, we are seeing an exodus of these amazing experienced nurses who are retiring. And that is impacting our popula our our profession in a huge way. So remember, I started out saying that yes, we're going to have some ample, you know, more opportunities for nurses. However, what we're identifying is that that growth is not going to overtake the needs of the population. And we've identified that there still will be a shortfall of nurses come. 10 years from now, 30 years from now, we we don't have a lot of data, you know, 30 years out, but they're saying within 2035, we more likely will have a, a really challenging time recruiting nurses. One of the things that you mentioned was, was um, the, I mentioned was the practice environment. That's another issue. What is actually going on in the practice environment that is contributing to nurses wanting to leave? Some of it has to do with workload. Some of it also has to do with what we're seeing now, which is an increase in workplace violence. I know I never, and I know you you also never signed up to get beat up when you go to, go to, go to work. 
We never signed up for that. We have been the individuals that were been there taking care of patients no matter what. And to have to experience violence is definitely challenging. The other thing that we're seeing is technology. The technology is just growing like leaks and bounds. And we're trying very hard to play catch up. You know, we we right now are in the midst of trying to identify what's going on with AI. We are trying to identify how do we use all of this technology to help nurses. And then of course, we, we ha cannot forget our long-term care partners. In that setting right now, the, the Congress has implemented some minimum, st minimum staffing challenges, staffing ratios. Or, and so we have to identify how are we in the acute care side going to then assist our long-term care partners to be able to make some of these things happen. Taking care of patients is what I mean. And then on the academic side, I don't see that, that work, the workforce issues are any different. Right now, we have a faculty shor shortage. We also have the baby boomers that are retiring. And the workload, when you look at it from a faculty perspective, we are expected to have you know, increase the number of applicants coming into the, the uh, university. So then what happens? You're going to end up taking more more students into your classes. And of course, when you look at what's going on with the nursing programs, there's a huge expansion related to simulation. There is, again, how do we incorporate as educators, incorporate AI into the curriculum and obtaining clinical sites? You know, how do we do that? Because again, hospitals are challenged with staffing. And so how do we, as in the academic side, partner with our, our practice individuals to be able to say, we need your help? So you there's know, a it's, lots it's, of things going on. It's interesting though, that um, what you are describing are just the things that young um, potential nurses need to know that the Opportunities actually across the nursing spectrum are huge. Um, they can be in acute care. They can be in home care. They, we have our nurses in telehealth. We have our nurses in research. We have our nurses that are on administrative tracks. Once you actually look under the hood of the opportunities for careers in nursing, it's just immense. Um, I think, though, that, you know, a lot of the infrastructure that we're depending on, AI and really using computers at the interface of patient care. A lot of our young nurses are far more facile in actually adopting um, these new techniques. I've done at least three epic go lives and my acute care nurses are the least of my concerns because give them 24 hours and they've already got it not. I guess a question I'd have for you though is um, all of us have to think about the groundwork in our institutions. <clears throat> so how do we better support our current teams? I think every hospital CEO is really focused on violence in the workplace. And, and all of us are you know, drawing a line in the sand with behaviors we'll accept and not accept and trying to support our teams. Um, what are the other things in terms of the infrastructure that we need to think about to support a robust nursing workforce for the future? And I love that question, Joanne, and I love it because it allows us to think outside of the box. I'm going to have to start with leadership because you mentioned how the leaders are putting some things in place related to violence. But I'm also going to say and I, I believe that you may have heard this quote from John Maxwell. And I heard him say one time that everything rises and falls on leadership. And if we don't have great leaders, exemplary leaders in place, we're not going to get the outcomes that we need. They're not going to be able to have the resources or think about those resources and tools that will be able to be put in place that will help our to create the, the robust workforce for the future that you mentioned. And so 
in nursing, yes, we have some exemplary leaders. However, what we have ch been challenged with is sometimes we take leaders in the clinical environment who are great clinicians. However, we don't give them the tools and the development that they need to be able to become those exemplary leaders. So the first thing I would say is to start with the leadership. Who are the leaders that you have around the table? What education and what support and what resources do they need? Because if they don't have those resources, they're not going to be able to build the robust workforce that you just mentioned. The other factor that I think is important to consider is that we bring them in and they leave. And they're leaving because, and research has told us that, they're leaving because of some of the things that we mentioned. The the violence in the in the workplace, the burnout that they're experiencing because of their workload. I think it's a two pronged approach. We have to fix the environment, you know, putting in those resources, the processes that will allow nurses to have the the tools to be able to create that environment. And then there also needs to be the on the other side of it, the academic side. That ac academic side needs to have practice ready. Their goal is to create these practice ready uh, applicants and graduates who can come into organizations and be just ready to go. And so it's a two pronged approach that I'm thinking of. Definitely it starts with leadership, but to fix that practice environment and then also go in and look at it from the academic side. What is it that they need to, to have that will contribute to the robust workforce of the future that we want so badly. So um, one thing that a lot of CEOs talk about is changing the workflow of nurses. Having shadowed a number of nurses, uh, first of all, I'm just amazed at the number of steps they put in. No matter how you design a unit, you know, they're they're booking about 10 to 15,000 steps every single day of work. Lots of walking. Um, but changing the workflow is harder than um, than it initially appears. What have been the innovative things that you have seen across the country or perhaps things you've implemented yourself to try to really make the nursing workflow more efficient and um, be less about fetching and caring and more about actually delivering care? And you bring up a very good point, Joanne, and thank you for that question. And I'm going to go with one, one thing, and that is, you mentioned it, I'm going to talk about some other things, but I think the predominant piece is to have the uh, integrate the conversation with the individuals that are closest to that work. And what I mean by that is if it if the workflow is going to be looking at the the, the how individuals move in a, dif a department or a unit, how they get patients, the input from those clinical nurses who actually take care of patients, it doesn't necessarily have to be the clinical nurses. It could be the unit assistant, it could be the pharmacist, it could be the secretary, it could be anybody that's closest to the patient to be able to understand their workflows. So that assessment using the eyes that are there day in and day out is crucial for that. One of the other things that I think is important, yes, adoption of technology, like the wearable um, monitors, the virtual nursing pieces, mm -hmm. using robotics to be able to go and fetch things. I believe that there is a couple of hospitals. And the one that I can think of right now is on um, the West Coast in California, and they have adopted uh, a robot to come in and do some of the the hunting and pecking of, of getting gathering things. The other piece I believe is important to say is that it's not necessarily a cooker cutter approach, meaning that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. And that is in the area of the units themselves, but also looking at it from a hospital perspective. What's going to fit uh, academic 
um, medical center may not fit a rural hospital. So I think it's important to do that complete assessment and make modifications based on that. I have this amazing colleague, Dr. Sil Trepanier, and he is out on the West Coast. And he says, if we're going to have an impact on workflow, we've got to, he uses this word, which I just love, deconstruct. Deconstruct what is currently in existence now, because sometimes we take what we think is new and put it in to something that's already there. His premise is that we totally deconstruct what we're doing right now, and then he look at it, and then look at reinventing the roles. Yeah, we may have a nursing assistant doing X, Y, Z, but is there something else that they can do that would allow the, the efficiency and the care that's needed? The other piece is, his, he says, and I, I totally agree with this, is to test new models of care. And what I'm, I'm looking at, though, when I go to the literature to say, okay, show me a model of care that would work in this particular environment with this size beds or in this type of hospital. That's hard to find. Yeah absolutely hard to find. And what we have done at AONL, the AONL Foundation has is now moving forward with, with creating, they're sponsoring a research study that's going to be looking at that so that we can identify which models may work best. And that research is, study is ongoing right now. And then the last thing that I would see is or mention is about change. And how do we look at those change models and the impact of change on our workforce. Um, question, following up on that point with uh, another question, um, how do you best integrate innovation in an environment where you're promoting change and we're trying to look at workflow? Um, you know, all of us in health systems sometimes get um, pretty stuck in our chain of command. And sometimes it's great for getting work done, but it also gets in the way of innovation. You mentioned about how do you engage people on the front line? What have you done in your organization or maybe what have you seen across the country that you'd like to highlight and people that have really been able to leverage innovation? And that is, that is a crucial question because a lot of us as leaders, we, we think that we can take something and just put it into a group of nurses or whoever to be able to say, this is going to work. I think it's important to be able to identify what is it that this new change is going to do. And I think that needs to be very clear and identify somebody that is what we're going to call um, uh, an adopter, an early adopter, because they're individuals. You mentioned the, the technology pieces. You can take a new piece of technology and somebody will use it. Well, is there an opportunity to sit down and say, who on my team is one of those early adopters? And can I engage them in helping to understand how it could fit into the workflow that we currently have now. And that innovation then will allow individuals to say, hmm, Joy's using this and I'm not. And so it's this little bit of a competition here mm -hmm. to say, Joy's using this, but I'm not, and she's having good results. I want some of that. And so how do we make it very attractive that our nurses will say, this is a good thing and I want it. And I think it's about communicating. How do we as leaders communicate change? How do we align that change with the values of the individuals that are working with us and for us? And then how do we take the values and align them to the values of the organization? Because I always see that if there's that misalignment, we're not gonna be able to make change happen as efficiently and as quickly as we want because mm -hmm. everybody signed up to become a nurse. I shouldn't say everybody. That's a very big, <laughs> you know, that's a very lofty piece at this point. I would say the majority of nurses signed up to do good, to help. And with that in mind, I think we can help them to be able to see how their actions will continue to 
help our patients in the long run? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us focus on pipeline and they say, you know, especially in New England, you know, people are getting old and it's cold up here and it's hard to recruit and retain young nurses. Um, and we've been spending an inordinate amount of time thinking about how do we fill up our pipeline? We have a lot of partnerships. You have been involved in a lot of institutions that have really created innovative partnerships. Aside from partnering with nursing schools, have you seen other partnerships that are a little bit unusual, but have been actually successful in um, actually repatriating people either back into the workforce or um, encouraging people to pursue careers in nursing? And that is an interesting question. And it's interesting because we have an opportunity in that space to be able to go in and have conversations. So for example, we have some industry partners. We have, you mentioned um, Epic with the EMR. Is there an opportunity to partner with Epic to say, I have this expert nurse and they have this expertise, and I see that this may be an area for you. Could we develop a partnership that will mm -hmm. allow them to work with you and then also to match what we need here in our organization? And, and the other piece is we also have some entrepreneurs some nurse entrepreneurs that are working extremely well in that space. Could we partner with them to be able to, to offer some education or development? And I don't mean as a, as a one-off piece, but to partner with them that allows something to be continuous and they will grow those leaders in a manner that is appropriate for that organization. So not necessarily the academic side. Yes, that's great. But I'm also wondering if there's an opportunity to do some to in some of the philanthropic um, spaces, the individuals like Johnson and Johnson, for example, would there be an opportunity to do that? Would there be an opportunity to, to have them, um, share, let's call it that right now, share their expertise on, on how they have, have been able to maneuver in that space. Not to say that we're going to take away from what they're doing, but is there an opportunity to be the eyes for them that will allow them to then expand what is necessary for nursing? So those would be a couple of ideas that perhaps some individuals, some organizations might be able to trial. Yeah, great points. Um, we have a number of people that are also very personally philanthropic and supporting nurses. And I notice across the country, it's far more common that people are supporting nursing programs or nursing education, um, nursing leadership development. Um, and it probably is not surprising since nurses are so well thought of by um, the American public. They're one of the most trusted individuals in our in our cultures by a number of people. So they they really want to support them. Um, so I'm going to ask you a, a personal question about advice that you would give to a young nurse who um, just got her RN and is entering into probably a busy um, either health system or academic environment. Um, and hmm. what we worry about the most is the well being of our nurses. You know, when our nurses leave the organization, they usually leave within a year. And it feels like a lost opportunity um, to, because um, we've invested a lot in that nurse, to have them leave and maybe be sour on medicine in general. And we don't want to do that. So what would be your advice for them to actually maintain a, a balance in their personal and professional life so they feel like um, they have a pretty strong core in terms of well-being as a nurse? 
And you've asked a question that is very dear to my heart. And the reason is sometimes these new nurses are challenged to speak up and to say mm. what they want. Mm. So my advice would be to understand what their needs are. I'm talking about that individual nurse. Mm. Understand what you need so that you can go and have a conversation with your leader. I don't believe that it's important, it, that it is valued to go in and make demands. Mm -hmm. So I think it's appropriate to have a, a professional conversation with your leader about what your needs are. And you'll mm -hmm. be surprised at what they say. You'll be surprised at how they listen and how they want to help that individual nurse, that new nurse. I also think that it's important for new nurses to realize that there's more. Mm -hmm. There's more out there as far as that small little unit that you're working on now. And I'm not trying to categorize a specific unit, but if you look at it from a holistic perspective, if you look at it from a, a pro nursing profession perspective, we started out talking about, well, there's so many roles, so many settings, so many different things that nurses can go into now. Mm -hmm. And it's not a one-stop shop. And I, what I mean by that is you can learn and grow in any environment. You just need to understand what your needs are and to come up with a plan that would allow you to have the, the resources and the support that you need. I would find a mentor mm -hmm. right off the bat. Find a mentor. If you can't find somebody who is a mentor for you or could be for you, then go and find some books. I couldn't find people in when I started out and I went and started reading books to see how would they, how would this particular individual, what are their thoughts? How do they think? Would there be some characteristics that I would be able to utilize? I started journaling, talking, you know, just writing down in my journal about what my feelings and thoughts were. Mm -hmm. And that helped me to be able to cope with some of the things that I was, I was seeing in the practice environment. I still do that to this day. Oh. I also think it's important to have some type of positivity. Duke University, I'm sure you're familiar with the studies from Duke University, where they looked at the positive um, things or gratitude that you would have to be thankful for the small little things mm. that you have seen or that you have done. And they've identified that if you do three things a day, at the end of your day, and identify a small win then that gives you better support, meaning that you have more sleep. There are some physical responses that were beneficial for that person. So I think it's looking at what are your needs. Some people love to do yoga. That's not me. I can't do yoga. Okay. Do that. If you like to get a massage, go get a massage. If you like to sit down and and um, listen to amazing classical music, some people like classical music because it's soothing. Find what works for you and then implement it on a consistent basis. Because if you don't look at it for a long term, meaning that if you don't do these things now, long term, you're going to burn out. Yeah. And that's not that what we want. Yeah, that is wonderful advice. I think that um, I tell a lot of leaders that um, you've got to restore your own kind of um, energy and sense of well-being so you can lead others. If you get depleted, it's difficult to be an effective leader in your organization. And um, that's very similar to what you pointed out would be an important life lesson for a nurse. You know, mm -hmm. stay positive appreciate what keeps you centered and strong from a well-being perspective. So, well, thank you for joining me today, Joy. It's really been a pleasure. And I appreciate you sharing your valuable expertise and insights. And I encourage all of our viewers to explore the workforce resources that are available through the American Hospital Association and through the American Association of Nurse Leaders. As you consider your own institutional workforce strategies and partnerships. So until next time, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I look forward to seeing you at next month's Leadership Dialogue. Have a wonderful day.